I'm Maxine Hayes, and I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues. And I'm retired pediatrician and emeritus UW, School of Public Health and School of Medicine. Thank you for having me. My name is Ina Abbey, and I'm the CEO of the Tubman Center for Health and Freedom. And on our screen here, we also have our colleague coming live. Hi there, it's great to be here with you. My name is Wendy Barrington. I'm associate professor at the University of Washington Schools of Nursing and Public Health and the director for the Center for Anti-Racism and Community Health. In the Black Wellbeing Report, I got really excited about two key approaches. The first one around community initiated and operated systems. That's really important. Um, that's why we founded the Tubman Center for Health and Freedom. Um, things that keep us well is community and it's each other. And a lot of us, we've been working in healthcare institutions, public health, um, but we actually haven't had an institution that is owned, operated, and driven by us. What really excites me about this report is the approach. We've tried everything and things aren't getting better, mm -hmm. especially for uh, segments of our population. Mm -hmm. And so I think the mere fact that um, going to the community and asking them and recognizing respectfully the assets That's right. that they can bring. In fact, they have the answers to a lot of the problems we're trying to solve. Exactly. And so it was like a, um, a, a breath of fresh air of energy uh, to see um, this evolve. And I hope this, this event will carry that, that uh, energy with it and it will continue. It definitely uplifts community solutions and approaches, yes. especially around community initiated and operated. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we started the Tubman Center for Health and Freedom. Uh, we were hearing the same thing from community. Mm -hmm. It's time, you know, for public health professionals. We know the gold standard of public health is for community to drive the process. Mm -hmm. And without that, then we can never do interventions on the systems that are making us sick. And so it's not just about individual behavior change that's impacting Absolutely. our health. It's about the systems that are making us unwell. And that was really prevalent in the report. And I appreciated to see that there. It's not just individual care. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that individuals are embedded in community. Yeah. And so what goes on in the community impacts what goes on um, the individual. Right. So, Wendy, what do you think about this? I would love to build on what you were just saying, Mother Maxine, because one of the community identified approaches in the report that really spoke to me was building a society that values health in action and not word. And I've been thinking about this a lot because it really reminds me of the word integrity, um, which has two meanings that I think are both related to this approach. The first is the quality of being honest and acting in alignment with one's values, being true to one's word and following through on one's commitments. And the second is the state of being whole and undivided. This idea of solidarity, that it's mm -hmm. that in order for us to move forward, we need to, to have integrity as a people, as a society. You know, mm -hmm. our North Star is equity and our actions need to be in service to that goal. So I really also really resonate with bringing this up a level. We can't be having this um, at the individual level. It needs to be at the community level, at the population level, you know, at the systems mm -hmm. level to make sure that we're creating environments that are supporting individuals to be able to thrive mm -hmm. and specifically um, Black individuals in this country. Mm -hmm. It's also um, very notable that, that we're taking um, a state approach, uh, the whole state, in terms of looking at um, where our, our populations are residing. And um, I don't think that we've, we've had anything quite like this before. Mm -hmm. So um, this approach, um, I hope, will prove that these types of of uh, interventions are not only valuable, 
but they are absolutely necessary to keep the momentum and the commitment to improving health. And health is more than care. That's right. the other thing. You know, health is more than care. It's, it's, um, it, it, you can hardly talk about anything without right. recognizing an impact that it has on health. Right. Health is in all things. It's in all things, yes. Yes. That's what struck me about the 2015 report, um, the first iteration of this 2022 report. Um, in that, one of the pieces of data that stuck out to me the most was even people, black folks with high incomes mm -hmm. with insurance still were not getting right. care. Yeah. And so when Wendy's talking about really this, you know, around dignity and care, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the times people say, oh, it's because somebody's poor. No, racism is the main driver to why black people are unhealthy. It's not about our doing. It's about the systems right. that are basically, when, when we say, you know, with George Floyd, get your knee off my neck was also a statement of, hey, mm -hmm. this oppression that we are under in the United States is killing us. Um, and so that's really important at a statewide level for us to uplift what these solutions mm -hmm. and these approaches are that are in this report. Absolutely. If I could just jump in and build off of something you just said, Ainai, because it really strikes me in terms of the primacy of racism and really needing to address that, being very focused and clear-eyed and not deviating from recognizing that we need to address structural racism. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the statistic that you cited is, is also, you know, born in other data sets in terms of Black families, Black individuals of higher socioeconomic status are still experiencing poor health, um, poor well-being than whites who are poorer or who have less education. So it's not just a class issue. It's, it's not just an economics issue. Right. There is the issue of racism and how that is structuring opportunity and resources and generational wealth and the ability to be able to not just another issue in the report that was highlighted, not just survive and kind of meet basic needs, but to actually thrive and to dream and to aspire. Um, and that's what we need to to not turn away from. It's very easy for I think our systems and our dominant culture, which I'm just going to name it, is is embedded in white supremacy culture, wanting us to veer and and turn our head from that because it's uncomfortable or we don't want to name it and we don't want to actually address it head on, and we have to. The have other to. thing I really like about this report is the timing. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a pandemic, yet that pandemic pull back the curtain on things that we've known for a very long time. And there we have huge disparities. I, I was very, um, uh, I, I was very happy to see the director for the Center for Disease Control name racism as, as being um, mm -hmm. one of those forces that continues um, mm -hmm. these, the data going right. in the wrong wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the timing of the report is has come. Mm -hmm. um, a better time for conversations about transparency and and mm -hmm. accountability. Mm -hmm. And um, and here again the community has to have a seat at every table. Right. And an audience that listens, respects and understands um, the work that we have to do mm -hmm. as a society. That's right. So um, I'm excited about that. I'm very happy that, um, that, that this has happened in Washington State. Yes. I dream of Black communities glowing with the knowledge and power to affect the changes needed and wanted to manifest their collective destinies, to be secure in their knowledge and expertise, to have faith as well as the receipts to document that their knowledge and expertise is working and is valued. And how am I manifesting that reality? Um, I mentioned I'm a professor at the University of Washington, an institution whose mission is to preserve, advance, and disseminate knowledge for the public good. 
And institutions of higher learning like the UW have been and continue to be inaccessible to those experiencing social marginalization, most especially Black Americans. We are, as an institution, therefore, in default of our mission um, because who we are, how we think, and what we do is not available nor benefiting all members of society. So I've recently stepped into a new role as the inaugural director for the Center for Anti-Racism and Community Health, um, affectionately known as the Arch Center at the UW. And our mission is to center the priorities and expertise of communities most impacted by structural racism and to take approaches that surface and address other dimensions of oppression simultaneously in that work, but still focusing and in, in, in recognizing racism as primary. Um, it's kind of a mind boggling approach, but it's also a very simple one at the same time, just by doing one thing. And that's really building a critical mass of faculty, staff, students, and community partners who are from the black community, who are from indigenous communities, um, and working with them to identify priorities and approaches and resourcing those efforts. It is so, um, Umbling to really dream. And being a pediatrician, I cannot help but love life at the very beginning, even before conception. Yes. Um, I dream about how many of our, our African American, our Black community, um, our um, I'm, I just had a freeze. <laughs> you mind if I chime in now? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. I got this. Okay. Um, I appreciate what you were saying. You know, for us, dreaming is so important. And a lot of the times, our futures get determined for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even on my way here, I talked to my mom. And my mom's like, you got this. And I'm like, yeah, I got this. You know, my mom told me I got this. And it's true. No one loves us like our family right. loves us. And no one holds us in the dignity like our family holds us in our dignity. And as a community, that is when we meet each other, when we share with each mm -hmm. other, we wish and hope for that within our health institutions. Um, I shared a story that I was in urgent care a couple of months back. And I was the... Um, one of the only black people in there and no one who was working there was black, but I could hear someone next door to me. Um, I think she, um, she was the janitor there. Um, and I could tell by her voice that she was my people. Oh. And so when they came to wheel me out to get an x-ray, um, I made sure I made eye contact with her and I said, hello. And it was both an affirming thing for both of us, because mm -hmm. for me too, as you know, they will you to the basement to do all this stuff. I want her to know I was here and I exist. Yes. And she affirmed me and I affirmed her because I'm like, I see you out here. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and so when you have those kinds of experiences, you know, a lot of the times people are like, no, you, this is a premier health institution. Come on in. Everybody's welcome. But when you step in, you know what time it is. This is not the same experience that you mm -hmm. have it within your communal level when you walk into those institutions until you see your own people. And so I think what I dream about and what I hope for and that I get to actualize is through the Tubman Center for Health and Freedom. Um, for us, we're in our design phase. It's really about listening mm -hmm. to community solutions, yeah. that it's driven by community. So it's not only about our service model, but it's about the built environment. Mm -hmm. It is about our referral network, what needs to be occurring within the environment that creates enabling conditions for us to be healthy. So it also means an active patient base that's engaging in advocacy. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, health mm -hmm. is in all things. It's in all things, it is. Yes. And for us to dream together and to actualize together. You know, one thing that makes me sad is to know that there are uh, black families bringing our black children into the world and the world doesn't even know what they lose yes. when investments are not made at the very beginning of life. In fact, even 
before conception, if we think about it, we need to pay attention to all of the men and women in the childbearing age racket. Yeah. That, 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 that area of the, of, of the continuum of health. And it is so important to give every child the same type of opportunity mm -hmm. um, that others take for granted. Yes. So that, and, and you so beautifully stated, the first community those children have is the family. Mm -hmm. And so um, recognizing that policies that support families mm -hmm. support children. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about Mm -hmm. what they want to do for kids, but they can't really see that unless the family and the community in which that child right. develops has um, the support and the attention that is needed for health. Mm -hmm. If I can build on this, because I it's reminding me of something I was just reading in terms of our conceptualization of what family is, mm -hmm. what the dominant narrative in terms of what family should look like and how it should function and how it really has brought us away from these extended familial networks or yeah. kinships and how family mm -hmm. is really has always been more expansive um, and and that is a good thing and that is something that we have cherished and value I really appreciate what you were saying I I know in terms of um, recognizing people, you know, in your context, recognizing mm -hmm. your people and, and being affirmed and, mm -hmm. and being acknowledged and, and having your existence be known. Um, you know, that to me is family as well. Mm -hmm. um, that, mm -hmm. that unspoken solidarity, that, that meeting of the eye and nodding of the head and just being able to continue on your day knowing like, someone sees you. Yes. And one of the things that we've missed so much in, in care is empathy. Mm -hmm. our, our providers don't have it. Mm -hmm. And that should bother us. That should bother us. We're having to teach how to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the first lessons learned um, uh, is going to, you know, it's going to help everybody. Um, but We've got to want to value that, mm -hmm. um, and and as as was so beautifully uh, stated, uh, the first reflection that we have are our families. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, for me, you know, a quick another story. This past Sunday was Mother's Day. Yes, and I went on a hike with my youngest child, and then we went to the park. And we were having a great day. And um, my son gets to the top of the ladder. He's ready to go down. And there was another kid up there. And the kid's like, sees my son. I can see right away the kid wants to cause some harm mm -hmm. to my son. So I look over at the white parent. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, um, watch your son. Because I can tell already he's, he's focused. Yeah. And the kid starts taking my son's fingers off of the handlebars as he's at the top of the ladder. And I'm waiting for the dad to respond. And the dad doesn't respond and my son's holding on. And then the kid spits in my son's oh. face. Oh. Oh. And I yell at the dad. And I'm like, your son just spit in my son's face. And the dad acted like nothing's wrong. And I said, you know what? This is taught. The disrespect mm -hmm. and not having dignity is taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I ran up there and I got my son and him and I, and I was crying more than he was. Oh, I know. And I was trying to hold I it know. together. I and I was like holding him. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying around not only what's going on in our families, mm -hmm. what's happening to us is not from what's occurring within our families. Mm -hmm. It's what's being taught. Mm -hmm. around white supremacy mm -hmm. it's what's being taught with these children yeah. and so when you get into these health institutions and people don't see us for who we are don't have empathy that didn't that didn't just happen in yes, medical that's school true. that's happened along the way when you look at displacement mm -hmm. 
oh, you know, you can't live with black people. You know, we have hyper segregated neighborhoods. Oh, yes. You know, and so it's it's all of these things. Again, the compounding of racism mm -hmm. impacts our health at every level where you live. Your zip code. Your zip code. Why my own neighbor at my own local park, one mm -hmm. block away from my house, has no dignity for my child. That is impacting my health. Yes, it is. And everything else. And everything else. I won't even get into saliva on the eye for COVID. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I wish I could hand sanitize his eye. <laughs> I was trying everything, but really the thing that hurt the most and that yes. still hurts yes. is my heart. Yes. We want to be seen as human beings. Yes. Humanity to humanity. And that's what has been lost. Yeah. And, and we have to come back to that as a community. And that's why the community is so important in these processes. I'm just really pleased to see uh, civic engagement and uh, community organizations organizing community organizing yes. these right. these these are these are methods by which um, yes i think that we can really try to get exactly community real change. organizing is how we yes. get to help exactly justice. exactly mm -hmm. community organizing is how we get there yes i think it's I amazing agree. that a lot of the themes that were identified in the well-being survey are so like you said interconnected all of yeah. it relates to health. You know, I think it can be easy to be disillusioned and not want to participate, not want to engage civically, but that's how we gain power. That's how we yes. make the changes that need to happen in order for us to thrive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to look like what's expected or um, mm -hmm. follow the rules, so to speak, because I think there's yeah. a lot to be said for activism and for coloring mm -hmm. outside the lines, if you will. And a lot of times the, mm -hmm. the, the constraints, the boundaries that exist were put there um, by people who are not us um, to serve their own ends. And also sometimes those boundaries are not necessary. They're not yeah, even needed. They're just... Right thought that they need to be there and they really aren't and so yeah. we can we can move beyond that but we yeah. we can't do that without engagement and engagement um, you know. and 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 without a commitment of the whole community yes mm -hmm. um and it means that if we all did our share um in terms of improving each other's environments um then the whole community thrives and, and really um, they, they get, get, get something out of that. Yes. It's, it's, it's we're, we actually have to find ways to do that more effectively, but even more to be very respectful of what the community can bring, That's which right. we have left out of the majority of our decisions right. in terms of, you know, who gets care, who earns, the right to have care and what kind of care it is. I'm happy to see well-being being, being um, out there as well yes. um, because it's been 50 years since I studied medicine and, and, the, and that, that language was, was just not even around. But now more and more we're recognizing that, that there is something to this that mm -hmm. we have, have missed. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the well-being piece is who yeah. gets to define well-being. I certainly mm -hmm. hope it's the community and right. not someone else trying to define that for them because mm -hmm. the community knows and it starts with the family. Yeah. Thank you, I just Wendy, wanna... for bringing that approach up. Um, in terms of action mm -hmm. um, and community-driven, those are the intersections of two of the approaches identified in the Black Well-Being mm -hmm. Report. Um, we've heard from community, even things like, you know, how the arrangements, rearranging things can lead to different outcomes. Right. I was talking with young people and they asked, why is there a security guard at the, at the front of every health institution? It's not to keep me safe. It's actually causing harm to me when I walk in. My anxiety's up. Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable walking in. You know, the security station sometimes bigger than the welcome station. 
Um, and so even young people pointing these things out around arrangements, mm -hmm. um, how the environment is arranged that makes you sick or how the environment's arranged that makes you be able to dream, mm -hmm. what is stifling, mm -hmm. who is burdened, mm -hmm. and who is benefiting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. are the questions. Who, who, who is burdened and who is benefiting? Something we need mm -hmm. to ask all along the way, the continuum. Mm -hmm. This trajectory of, of care over the lifespan from womb to tomb, I say. That's right. From womb to tomb. That's right. All right. I'd like to just build on something that you were saying, Mother Maxine, in terms of who gets to define what well-being is. I think that's so incredibly important because it's interesting. It reminds me of, of a project that I was asked to kind of come in on where you know, a funder wanted to say, hey, we want to kind of devise this metric of community well-being. And this is what we're thinking of. We're thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. how many people in an area have a high school education, you know, what the average um, household income is, all of these metrics related to socioeconomic status. And I'm like, hmm, I bet you that's really kind of reflective, perhaps, of well-being mm -hmm. for certain populations, but I imagine probably not all populations. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be a good idea for us to talk to communities if, if your goal is really to be a resource for promoting equity within communities, mm -hmm. then let's ask communities how they define. Well yes. Right. yes. And, <laughs> and that was something that just didn't occur to them, but we mm -hmm. were able to do it. And a lot of what came out was this idea of of ease, of not needing to worry about racial um, discrimination, about being able to walk or be in their neighborhoods and be able to contribute toward their family and not have this constant specter mm -hmm. of threat. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and that would never have been elucidated just by taking the, the usual metrics for well-being. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's why this is such an incredibly exciting um, effort. This, mm -hmm. this assessment has just been mm -hmm. so incredibly comprehensive and completely driven by the community, by the Black mm -hmm. community. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's really um, inspirational. Inspirational, it is for sure. Well, I know one thing I'm learning is that the narrative needs to change. That's right. We all carry these narratives in our heads, in our minds. You know, e e you know even the people who are opp uh, oppressed, we mm -hmm. have these, these narratives that are not true. Right. And so it's, it's, it's time, I think, to really rewrite the narratives yeah. so that it's closer to being the reality. Mm -hmm. Um, and <laughs> I guess some people are afraid to go there, but, but until we do, we're, we're not going to have health equity. Right. Racism makes us all sick. Yes. It makes us all sick. It does. And, um, and, and I think Wendy, um, uh, you know, alluded to that as well. Um, the, the narratives have got to be rewritten and they've got to consider everything the community says about what it perceives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we go from there, mm -hmm. <laughs> not the other way. That's right. Wendy? I would say a key area of growth for me has really occurred over the last two years. Um, it's really been a crystallization in my understanding of white supremacy culture and how it manifests not only in systems, but even within myself. And I think this kind of um, ties directly to what you were saying, Maxine, in terms of the narratives um, that we hold so close. Um, you know, just realizing that we are all socialized in this country to be yes. pro-white, how critical it was to my well-being when I was growing up to assimilate, how I never could how I flatly reject this assimilation now, but also recognize that it's an insidious learned tendency yeah. and a cancer that I constantly have to check myself for, yeah. that we all need to check ourselves for, because I think we are all 
you know, affected by racism in, in, in different ways. Um, the other key growth area for me um, is to be explicitly anti-racist. You know, before I kind of was able to do the work without saying the word racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to name things. I mean, kind of going again back to what you were saying, Maxine, in terms of narrative, I mean, language is so incredibly important yeah. to be able to use words, um, to be able to kind of label processes mm -hmm. or mechanisms for what they mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. so that they can be changed. So they can't kind of slide and, and hide yeah. and kind of continue to be mm -hmm. under the radar that we're calling it out yeah. and we're, we're examining and interrogating and, and dismantling it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Wendy. That is <laughs> um, for me, you know, personal growth, but also in how I ask questions. Mm -hmm. So one of my primary mm -hmm. questions I ask now is, how do you operationalize anti-racism in your work? Because it's a question for all mm -hmm. of us. A lot of the times, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're told, oh, this is the anti-racism project over here or funding mm -hmm. over here. But we never ask the corollary. We never ask them, what's the flip? If this, you know, $25 million is for anti-racism, well, mm -hmm. what's the other $6 billion for? Racism? <laughs> And so yeah. a lot of the time people distance mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. from it as mm -hmm. if they're not taking part in it mm -hmm. when it is in all things. Mm -hmm. Health is in all things mm -hmm. and we're sick because of racism being in all things. That's true. And so if we can, everyone sits down and say, hey, how am I operationalizing anti-racism? Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. puts you in the action seat, not as a bystander or a silent participant. Mm -hmm. Um, in mm -hmm. it, but what are the things that I'm doing to address these things within my purview? Excellent. Yes, I think that you're so right. Um, and until we have whatever it takes for all of us to see that, and it's going to be hard for some to admit it because the first line of defense about a false narrative is denial. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just not true. And, and so, and that's why, it's, you know, our community activism and organizing in the community has to take all of this into right. consideration. Yeah. Because we can't do this without everybody doing what they are supposed to do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the accountability, yeah. the transparency, and not behind, uh, hiding behind, um, you know, hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, well, what about the people who are on the other side of receiving that? Mm -hmm. um, when, our, when our people come into some of these systems, they're not coming on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. We're coming with years, mm -hmm. centuries mm -hmm. of mistreatment and injustice. Mm -hmm. And centuries of solutions. Yes, and centuries of solutions. And thank you for saying that. Yes. Because, you know, we have to really um, keep yes keep our eyes on, on what we know does right. work. Exactly. And the community it can be that eye. And that's what I love about the Black Wellbeing Report. Mm -hmm. Really uplifting mm -hmm. what these approaches mm -hmm. are. Really uplifting what solutions look like in real time. Um, and hearing that from statewide organizations, hearing that from local communities, and mm -hmm. that the themes cut across the board. Yes, they cut across the board. And many of them are, um, are invisible to um, the majority because they don't know what it even looks like. Right. Mm -hmm. To not have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Or, and, or they've also been trained to see us in a certain light. Yes. Mm -hmm. Black death is a very lucrative industry. Oh, there are so many organizations out yeah. there, so many things that benefit mm -hmm. off of our demise, That's that true. fundraise on our demise. Mm -hmm. But black well-being, it's not something that is invested in. It actually has counter investments. When community starts determining what community needs, then money gets put into the counter investment against what community wants. And so it, I think it's about solutions, but it's mm -hmm. also about mm -hmm. 
unearthing systemic yes. racism. Right. Yeah. Uh, when people talk about, oh, there's, for example, Tubman Health, mm -hmm. a community-driven solution. Mm -hmm. We're running an $80 million capital campaign for our flagship. $40 million is going to go into the built environment designed, operated by community. $40 million is going to go into services for healing. With that, we're told quite a few times, that's a lot of money. We're like, according <laughs> to who? In 2020 alone, $10 billion was after taxes, the net profit in Washington state from the health industry. So... I'm looking at those numbers, again, this question around, okay, mm -hmm. well, if this over here is the anti-racism effort, well, what is the $10 yes. billion dollar net profit that came actually from our communities because we're not doing well, and then we're not getting the proper services, mm -hmm. and then we can't actually invest in community-driven solutions. It's, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. It's a hypocrisy. Um, so the gold standard of public health practice mm -hmm. is community driven. So when are we going to invest in the community driven solutions? Designed by the community. Designed and by the forward. community. Brought forward. Yes. Owned by community, operated by community mm -hmm. for all people, mm -hmm. for all people. And we know that when you address it, you raise the tide for all ships. Yes. We've been looking at that tide for a long time. Yes. <laughs> I think part of what's needed is anti-racist accountability, especially among our leadership. Um, yeah. You know, I was, I'm reminded of Dr. Kamara Jones and her mm -hmm. allegory about the gardener's tale yeah. and the different levels of racism. And, and at the end of the tale, she's essentially says that the gardener, the person who is, allocating resources and, and helping the flowers to grow, that gardener needs to be aligned with equity. There's just yeah. no other way this is gonna work. So how do we ensure that we have leaders who are aligned with equity and have the capacity to act, to be able to steward in a way that is anti-racist? Kind of going back to what you were saying, Ine, in terms of what are the action? How can I be operating within my context in a way that is anti-racist? Because I think also, you know, leadership comes at the family level. It comes mm -hmm. at the community level. It comes mm -hmm. at the school level. You know, it's not just our elected officials. It's all of mm -hmm. us. We're all leaders in some way, shape, or form. Um, mm -hmm. But we also need to build a critical mask and put ourselves in those places of power so that we can begin to actualize an anti-racist agenda. And just because you're black or a person of color doesn't mean that you're gonna be an anti-racist leader. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an anti-racist leader is someone who is interrogating the mechanisms of inequity and, and working with those who are most impacted to enact solutions for its disruption. And that person can look any way that they look. It's about mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, that mm -hmm. to me is anti-racist leadership. Mm -hmm. But I will say mm -hmm. that, you know, those who are most impacted, those who are coming mm -hmm. from communities of color are more likely to be able to see what's happening and to be yeah. able to kind of come up with alternative strategies um, and try new ways of doing and being um, in order to, to facilitate mm -hmm. that disruption. Mm -hmm. And if we don't start with our, our youngest, because they are the next generation, and every generation has an assignment from our creator to make this yes. place more, more palatable than it is. And um, we've got to make those investments early. Yes. Um, people are very much moved on the policy side by you know, all the disparities, but how much of these disparities did we contribute to ourselves by our inaction of mm -hmm. possible solutions? Mm -hmm. By not asking the community, um, you know, it's, it's almost like leading the blind with the blind. Mm -hmm. um, if people were really doing assessment, you know, we would have at least um, 
a, a picture, but how clear is this picture when, when we may have even been measuring the wrong things? That's right. Um, and in well-being, what do you measure? Mm -hmm. uh, that should be asked of the community. Mm -hmm. You know, they have some thoughts about this too. Definitely. And Wendy, what you were sharing, um, I think is spot on. Anti-Black racism is taught. Um, and you don't, you know, have to be white or black to mm -hmm. be someone who has learned those things and who are enacting it, those right. things. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think very much so when we were talking about our schooling, our education, our system, mm -hmm. you know, you were sharing a story just on assimilation. Um, I think that's exactly what it is. Uh, you walk into a room, you know what time it is. Um, you know, you know your surroundings and you know, I have to fit in. And so when white supremacy is up, held as the dominant culture anti-black racism is a thing that's taught to say okay mm -hmm. whatever i do i don't want to be like them and they are down there and you know what even though i'm black i, I don't want to be like them i'm going to keep assimilating and we see that even within the workforce mm -hmm. um folks are climbing the ladder everyone says the ladder the ladder okay what well what is the ladder <laughs> it's assimilation <laughs> It's not mm -hmm. based on skills. It's based on who you know, who likes you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, our economy, there is no space for everyone. And so this is why we utilize racism to keep people at Damn. the margins. Yep. Um, That's why college is not for everyone. We keep people at the margins. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you get into these institutions? You assimilate. Um, and so a lot of the times, you know, even this question around my personal growth, it's like, you know, the higher you get in education, you know, you get a master's degree in, in public administration and government and finance, you really learn about assimilation. Um, and colonization. And colonization. And so part of my job now, as within mm -hmm. my leadership mm -hmm. as CEO, I have to ask myself, again, how am I operationalizing our mission for health and freedom? And it's not from the textbooks and it's not from mm -hmm. all the things that I... I learned in school. Yes. It's actually the opposite. And that's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> because we need, we need what, what we have been working with hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It hasn't worked mm -hmm. because a lot of times we were not really painting the picture that was really accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, part of this narrative again. Mm -hmm. And, um, so there are things that we really do need to need to start over. Yes. Um, and the missing piece, I think the richness of what has happened here is recognizing that the community is that living organic body mm -hmm. that, um, um, that, that we've got to tap into. And we have people who are willing to step forward mm -hmm. in in some of these, that's right. These areas we're on ancestral assignments. Yes, on ancestral assignments. That's right. Exactly. Okay. The time has come. The time has come for the generations, and we're still here. And many of our um, colleagues have passed on, but we're still here we're with still the mission. Mm -hmm. With the mission, and this okay. is our assignment. And the, and the Creator would not have given it to us if they didn't believe we had everything we needed to do it. That's right. You know, Ine, I really appreciate um, your sharing with us the, mm -hmm. the new way that that mm -hmm. Tubman Center is being structured to be able to kind of move outside of, you outside. know, our traditional hierarchies in terms of organizations. And, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm a kindred spirit with you in terms of that is really, that is mm -hmm. really the the intent behind the Arch Center as well, to be able to bring in communities in setting priorities and being able to make decisions about how resources are allocated, what we're actually doing, and, and really having those solutions be coming from communities who are most impacted. Mm -hmm. um, we are also in our building phase. Our center officially launched during Black History Month of this year, and we're starting demonstration projects to actually test this model and refine our process. Mm -hmm. And this improvement process will always be a part of who we are and how we come to the work because we recognize that, you know, as a primarily white institution at the UW, that we need to do things differently. Um, 
Mother Maxine, you mentioned activism. You know, I think that is so critical and an essential part of public health practice that really is not fully unleashed. Mm-hmm. You know, institutions mm-hmm. are hotbeds of white supremacy culture and they need to be cracked open and they need to be infused with activism. Um, there's a precedent here, of course, with the Black student unions and the activism of students, but that needs to be translated throughout the institution to include both mm-hmm. faculty and staff and actually bring community in um, mm-hmm. to be able to co-create um, the knowledge and to actually ensure that that knowledge is of benefit to those who are in most in need. You know, we need to infuse our institutions with the knowledge and expertise of the communities we serve, not in an extractive way, but in a transformational way to be mm-hmm. able to include communities. Because if, if, if we're here to serve the public good, we need to include the public in that work mm-hmm. to keep mm-hmm. us innovating, to keep us relevant, to keep us mission focused and to hold us accountable. Um, you know, how do we partner in that work for the black community? There might be a few ways that we can work together to actualize black well-being. First, if you're interested in attending the UW as a student or partnering with the Arch Center as a community member or organization, please reach out to me. I would love to sit down and share coffee or tea and explore your interests, your aspirations, your goals, and how the Arch Center can play a role in your success. For those outside the black community, we all we need all hands on deck, quite frankly, to do the heavy lifting for equity. Do your homework to understand white supremacy culture norms and interrogate your positionality. Be open and be humble. Be conversant in anti racist dialogue within your own communities, because that's where the work needs to be done. We can't do it ourselves. You need to do your own work. Um, this itself will review opportunities for how we can work together to address anti blackness and anti indigeneity in your own communities. Mm-hmm. And I want to put a plug in for the arts, um, the role that the arts can really help us do a lot of the heavy lifting work. Because it, 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 as we've said earlier on in, in the conversation, um, language and culture are so important in shaping how people think, how, you know, and so this has got to be and we know we don't have we don't have have the the um, the power um, in a lot of these um, areas, but the potential for developing that through community organizing and civic engagement is 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 there, mm-hmm. and it can it can be very threatening. But at the same time, uh, we need to bring everybody mm-hmm. along with us. It, it can't just be um, uh, all black, all black, because there are those that there are others in the community that we need to also bring because they bring resources that we currently don't have. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but they need to be truly transformed mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. true to the work of, of uh, building something that the whole community can say we did this because we wanted to be healthy and mm-hmm. also have well-being. Mm-hmm. I mean, something that 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 can be valued over time. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the timing is really right. is right. Mm-hmm. It's the timing, and the and the reason I go, go back to the arts is that some of the conversations we're going to have to have, and they they've got to be not sugar coated. They've got to be the, the you know. As, as real as they can be. Um, and we may need other modes of communicating that, like the arts. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be the lyrics. Um, it can be the plays. It can be the operas. You know, I saw um, Blue, mm-hmm. the opera Blue. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 um, and it, 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 it took a, a very polarizing topic to really peer into the real lives of real people um, having been impacted by um, uh, the police. So I think that we're in, a, in an era now where we can actually have artists ourselves mm-hmm. to help us um, 
with some of the conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, whether it's poetry or music or dance, um, many forms, many art forms. Yeah. But I don't want to, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture of all the types of leaders we have in our community that can bring to this work. That's right. um, and sometimes it, it begins with language and, and trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. And there are certain languages that are universal. And music is one of them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, um, and I think Oprah has dem demonstrated with her documentary um, that is coming out um, on the color of care. And then um, we we have uh, other examples of the of 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 of, of the African American and Black women increased mortality rate from mm -hmm. just childbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there's a documentary on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very, very encouraged that yeah. we can integrate some of those things to get us to really not only yeah. uh, act and feel, but act and really see. I really like that point. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge everything that I do is in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, it does take a village, and that's the way it's also village. organizationally. Um, organizations and institutions and individuals and communities, mm -hmm. that is how we operate in our society. The question is, what is the thing that we're operating around? And so if we're operating around anti-racism, that's where most of my partnerships come with. Um, one of our first key partnerships was with Rainier Valley Leadership Academy, the only mm -hmm. anti-racist charter school in this state. Mm -hmm. um, another one of our partnerships was with the Black Community Impact Alliance. It's to it's statewide and it's to support all Washingtonians, especially Black Washingtonians around economic justice, around health justice, to address mm -hmm. these root causes. Um, but it's really, again, who is, mm -hmm. what, what are we, what are partnerships centered around? Right. And so for point. us, one of our um, guiding principles is to reject white supremacy in all of its forms. Mm -hmm. And that has limited the amount of partnerships we can have because, again, if, if organizations and people haven't done this self-reflecting yeah, or don't act or behave in that way, mm -hmm. then it becomes hard to partner. Uh, mm -hmm. Because again, that is a counter investment or a counter strategy against community solutions. So for us, it's we're really clear. It's we're supporting um, structures around community solutions, um, mm -hmm. and it comes from the community and it takes a village. And That's so the we call that test. exactly. And we call that the Black Health ecosystem. Um, it's going to take all mm -hmm. of us. You know, it is about all these organizations. Right. It's it's about people who are providing housing. Mm -hmm. It's about people who are, you know, working in direct services. Mm -hmm. um, and that the issue is not just um, you are my client. The issue is that I believe in your dignity. I yes. believe in your self-determination. Yes, I believe in the things that you're telling me that are most beneficial for you. Um, mm -hmm. And that is not about um mm -hmm. the race of the actual person mm -hmm. that is have you centered white supremacy or have you centered anti-racism that's really important to make that distinction and i'm so happy to hear that because many times we we say the words but we haven't we haven't been uh explicit enough yes and the focus i think is a, is a litmus test mm -hmm. as as to whether you know this is the right part for us or not mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah.